Now, in Matthew 25, Matthew 24 is, is very prophetic. There's a ton of stuff in there. I taught on some of these things here not too long ago, and I, I warned the class before we even got started. I said, I hope you brought a steak knife. And everybody's looking at each other like, where's he going? What is? This is what we call meat of the word. This gets a little deep. And you want it in little bites because you try to eat too much, you choke. But this is Matthew 25, this right here. Now, the end of Matthew 24, he says it several times in that chapter. He says, of the day and of the hour, you know not. I don't know when Jesus is coming. I told a Sunday school class this morning, listening to the news, I began to hear things. And you know what? Newscasters will say prophetic things and not even know it. A lot of them aren't Christians. They don't know what the Bible says. Some of them are. I listen to their words. I can tell they have faith. A lot of them, they haven't got the biggest idea what they're saying. But as he begins to read his little report, you ever watch him news catchers? They're so good. They've got big smiles and suits and ties on. And you watch their eyes go back and forth while they're reading the teleprompter. And he's reading. And when he began to read, I automatically reached over. My laptop was there. I brought my Bible up and I started looking. What the man was saying was prophetic. Jesus is coming. I'll never, I'm not going to, you know me better. I'm not giving you no days, hours, times, or anything else. Guess what? He's coming. From the day of his ascension, the day, from, from Acts chapter 2, the day he left here, what the angels say, in the same like manner, he's coming back. So he's been coming for a long time. But yeah, he's coming. But I'm going to read Matthew 25. I'm going to read the first 13 verses. Now, most of us know this story. Five wise and five foolish, right? What are we talking about? Virgins. Now, there was a reason. Now, I want to touch on Judaic law and some things just a little bit this morning. But in, in Judaic law, they didn't do much of anything unless they had ten. You couldn't have synagogue unless you had ten people. You, they, ten was a big deal. If you go in Ruth chapter 4, let's see if my brain works. Man wants to sit down with the council, and he wants to talk about getting him a bride. He was the kinsman redeemer. There's a whole message in that. I won't preach this morning, but it's a good message. He's the kinsman redeemer, and before he can even bring it before the council, he's got to have ten people sit down. So it was just the way they'd done things. So 10's a big deal. Now they're getting ready to have a wedding. You got 10. You got 10. Now their job was, as the bridegroom came, see, they done things different than we do here in America. But what do we say in America? They, they even got TV shows. What do they call that? Bridezilla? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've never watched it. I just, it popped up one day. I was like, what in the world's it? No, no offense, ladies, I'm a pretty nice fellow, but when I watched it, just about two minutes of that, I went, yeah, I'm not putting up with her. <laughs> not even on TV. I'll turn this off, take a nap. But see, they, we talk about in our country, in our nation, we talk about uh, um, waiting on the bride. We've got to wait for the bride, we've got to wait for the bride. Well, back then, you're waiting on the groom. And it was his decision when he showed up. Now, they didn't have the biggest idea when he showed up. Now, their job once he shows up, is to run down into the street and to light the way of the procession as they go to the home for him to get his bride. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. I hope we got that, right? Jesus is the bridegroom. We're the bride. And there's got to be somebody to sort of light the way. But not everybody that's going to light the way is ready to light the way. Let me read this. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to me. 
And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. And the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Amen. Oil in a lamp. Anna, don't freak out or anything here. Um, there's no oil in it. No oil in it. I didn't put any oil. I got oil in my hand. This is actually scented and colored oil. I got a bunch of different oils. I got this so you can see it. It's red. Is this necessary? Of course it is. Is this necessary? Of course it is. What is this without oil? It's a lamp. It's not a light. Listen, this never ceases being a lamp. It's been in my garage. I don't know how long I had to go out and dig it up. I got them great big glass things in the house, and I thought, I'm going to carry that to church. My wife would have to dust it, clean it all up, make it pretty, and polish the brass on it and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to hear her, so I'll go out and broad you find this one. So here it is. I did knock the cobwebs and stuff off of it. But without this, that's a lamp, not a light. Just a lamp. And you know something? I'm going to read a bunch of verses here in a little bit. You were never called of God to be a lamp. Not one time in there, and I have read, I studied the other night, I wanted to look and see, and I could not find one place where anybody was ever called to be a lamp. Well, I'm going to show you a bunch of verses where you call to be a light. Did you know there's a difference? Anybody ever have the power to go out in your house and you run and grab your flashlight and the batteries are dead? Okay. What good is it? What good is it when you're holding something in your hand, you know it has a use, you know it has a purpose, it's there for a reason, but it has no power. <clears throat> Other day we got, the wife had forgot we had a whole house generator put in and the lights were flickering with the big winds and storms we had the other day. And I come in the house and she's got my, one of my big flashlights sitting there on the edge of the couch. I said, what are you doing? In case the power goes out. Well, I just paid a whole lot of money. <laughs> and it better work. <laughs> and first thing she said was, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Guess what? I got auxiliary power if the power goes out. Amen. But the idea is, you still got to have power. No matter where it is. I'm going to set this right back here. Since I'm done talking, I'm going to go to preaching just a minute. Now, I hope any of you and all of you believe that Jesus is coming back. <clears throat> but here's the question this morning, and I like questions when I preach. When Jesus comes back, is he going to find us awake or asleep at the wheel? Yeah. I heard a story some years ago. My grandfather passed, another guy told me, he says, you know, he said, my, my grandpa died in his sleep. And I said, that's good. He said, yeah, it was good. He said, he wasn't screaming like the other six people in the car he was driving. <laughs> <laughs> so it's according to the circumstances. It's always good to take a nap. Not always. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, and we've said it many times, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. When he comes, what's he going to find when he gets here? Now, there are ministries out there, a lot of churches, they, they teach the fact that when the church is prepared, Jesus is coming. 
Let me tell you what, I read the book, and you know what it says? It says he has an appointed day and an appointed hour, and it's going to be ready or not. Here I come. Anybody ever play when you were kids? Ready or not, here I come. So we have something we have to do in this thing. Number one, there's a word that goes throughout. There's a couple different words that every time I teach eschatology, a big fancy word for Jesus is coming. Every time I sit down to study, I, I find two words that, that come up to me every time. One of them is deception. Do not be deceived. Understand the great liar is coming, and, and he lied to Adam and Eve in the beginning, and he's continued to do so, and he's getting better at it. The second word that I always see is watch. Church, we have a responsibility to watch. I started out with the story of the news guy. And he's going on, and guess what? All of a sudden, he ran into two or three words in two or three countries, and I had my Bible at it, and I'm leafing through. And guess where I found my answers? I found them in Ezekiel 39. They're written in a book. They're written in a book. And I'm watching as things are unfolding and things are coming. I'm not one of those doomsday guys. Guess what? I, I think the worst I ever saw was the first Gulf War. Every church, every place, every pastor that I knew was calling me on the phone. Pastor Tom, do you think this is it? Do you think Jesus is coming? My answer was, do you think he's just coming for you or for all of us? Because the rules are the same. And he got real quiet. What do you mean? Well, I got a verse in here that says, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I got the biggest idea. This may be my last tomorrow. I've got no idea. My job is to tell you that Jesus is coming and to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. For he has brought me to this place. I, that's what I do. That's what I do. And I think most of us know there's a lot of parables in the Bible. And you never want to be a lamp. You want to be a light. Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. Verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. Red letter stuff. If the world's going to see anything about what is coming, they have to see it through the church, and through the people of God. Road rage situation. Anybody ever witnessed those? I watched one the other day. You know what was funny? It was two 30-something women. You guys can get mean. <laughs> Oh, they were trying to hit each other all over the road. I just slowed down and backed up. My brother was with me. He said, what are you going to do? I said, nothing. <laughs> I'm not getting in the middle of this. They look mean. <laughs> they look mean. <clears throat> but things happen all the time. So when, you, when you're dealing with something, well, we, we, you just have to pray. You have to, Lord, don't let them, yeah. But in a road rage situation, ladies driving nuts, here come a policeman, he pulls him behind her, and he pulls her over, drags her out of the car, and he puts her in handcuffs, throws her in the back seat of the car. What are you arresting me for? <laughs> he makes two or three phone calls, he gets her out of the handcuffs, and he says, he writes her a ticket for what she was doing, he says, but you can go. Well, why did you put me in handcuffs? He said, well, I saw the, the iskers, the fish on the back of your car, and the name of the church and the way he was driving, I thought for sure you couldn't be a Christian. You had to have stolen it. <laughs> thought for sure he was a car thief because Christians don't act that way. Let me, let me add this. Do they? There's a reason that, and seriously, I'm for every constitutional right that, that, that's ever been written because there's purposes for all of them. But I do believe there's folks out there in traffic have no business carrying guns. So I'll just leave that away. Amen. 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 <laughs> so what does it say? You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men hide a candle but they, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all them that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what dis distinguishes this from a light and a lamp? Well, what's, what's the difference in this again? Oh, yeah. That's all. That's all. Now I can show you in a whole bunch of scriptures. You know what the oil of God is always designated as? It's his spirit. 
The Spirit of God should rest within us. We were joking. Who was carrying a WD earlier? Somebody carrying a can of WD over there? And I, I told them, I said, well, we'll take a little drill and like put little holes in the joints and we'll shoot that in there and see if it works. And she didn't even tell me no. She just handed me the can. <laughs> I think she wanted to see how far I would go with it. <clears throat> but sometimes we need lubed up, don't we? Anybody ever get out of bed and you, you got noises you didn't have before? <laughs> I got a recliner with a motor on it. It's still hard to get up sometimes. And we, we know how that feels. Now there's a spiritual man in here. There, there are old sayings that, that go back for generations and a lot of them came down through the American Indians and what have you. And they said inside of every man is two wolves and they fight. And the one that wins is the one you feed. The one you make stronger, the one you, and guess what? Inside of each and every one of us, there are two. You've got a will, God's got a will. I wonder who wins. The one you feed. The one you feed. The one that, that you put out there and, and give them what they need to survive. See, Satan really wants you to be unprepared for his coming. Mark 13, 5, there's one of those words. Jesus said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. You can listen to me this morning, and what I pray that you do is take my words, go home, look in your book, and see if I'm telling you the truth or not. I pray, God, you do that. Because you need to know. The last thing you need to do if a serious situation comes up is say, Pastor Tom said, you need to know that Jesus said you need to know that, that it's written in a book. That's what you need to know. Now prayerfully, when I'm standing up here, I'm not lying to you. Let's see, we're going to get closer and closer to November. Anybody on the TV ever lie to you? <laughs> Anybody on TV ever lie to you? You know the sad part is, and I don't want to preach politics this morning. The sad part is, I believe some of them actually mean what they say. It's just when they get there, they're not able to do it because they don't have the will or the way to get it done. I believe some of them would even keep their word if they could. But guess what? I'm just a man. I might tell you I'll be there at 4.30 and get a flat. I may not make it. I'm just a human being. And I wouldn't intentionally lie to you. But guess what? It's life happens. Anybody ever feel bad because you couldn't get something done that you really wanted to do, even you said you would do? Well, of course, it's just humanity. That's just humanity. Really. Hell, if, if they've tried it all, they, they want you to stay in the world. They don't want you becoming a Christian. They don't want anything like that to ever happen to you. But if you become one, if you overcome, if you ask the Lord in your heart as your personal Savior, and you sit down and do nothing, you make hell so happy. They're not afraid of you. They're not even going to bother you. Why bother you? You're not doing nothing. You know, the people I, I've seen that, that hell comes against the hardest is the people that put their nose to it and say, I will be what God would have for me to be. Now, you're going to have problems in your life. Oh, there's neat verses in here. In this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And when we rest in him, I'm never going to tell you that nothing bad's ever going to happen. I'm going to tell you you're going to win. Why? Because of him that saved us. And we sort of have to get an attitude sometimes when it comes to our Christian walks. And we're told to, to I mean, honestly, you guys have good parents? What happened if you run in a room and interrupted your mom or dad and they were talking? I didn't even have to say nothing. He just had to look. <laughs> you went from this to this real fast. And, and you've done, and you knew, and you were taught, and you were trained. Well, being good people, most of us carry that over in our Christian walk. And don't misunderstand me. We should always be good people. We should be, be humble and contrite and everything else. When it comes to facing the, the enemy, you need to know that you've got a shield of faith and a sword of the spirit, and you need to be in your book and learn how to fight. 
You need to learn how to fight. And your enemy isn't always smaller than you. Years ago, a lady brought a child to my house and he was all bruised up. Big kid. She says, look what your son done. And I'm thinking, whoa. Raised his shirt up, he got big bruises on him. Well, of course, first thing I'd done, my boys are three years apart, I yelled at the oldest boy, I said, get up here. Now, my oldest boy was smaller than him. I said, son, what did you do? He got that glare look in his face, and he said, it wasn't me, Dad. <laughs> Lady says, you're a liar. I said, stop right there. He knows me. And he knows he's in way worse trouble if he lies to me. And I'm looking him in the face, and he did not lie. So you step back. And I said, do you know anything about it? He nodded his head, and I said, what happened? He said, it was John, and that's the youngest one. <laughs> I said, what? So now I got a little angry. I'm dad. I said, as big as you are, you're jumping on my little tiny boy? I said, this isn't happening again, and you'll answer to me. We, we clear on this? And the lady's getting a little upset. So I called my youngest boy up there, and I said, what did you do? What did you hit him with? You beating this boy with a ball bat? What happened? He's claustrophobic. You cover his face, he panics. And the boy, being a bully, grabbed him in a headlock, and he pulled his head in. My son turned his head and put his teeth to him. I said, what happened, son? He said, he started begging, Dad. Let me go, let me go. I said, what did you do? He said, well, somebody taught me if you have to bite, bite till your teeth touch. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you who taught him that. <laughs> but guess what? Bullying stopped immediately. I didn't have to do it. Now, I'm dad, and I would have done it. And any of you dads out there, you know you would have done it. You just straightened the situation out. We're not going to have them do it. Guess what? I didn't have to. One simple fact. He fought back. Now, I'm not telling you to get out here and start beating on folks. I'm telling you, when hell comes your way, learn to fight back. The biggest way you're going to learn to fight back is on your knees. But you've got to be a light and not a lamp. And the power of God must rest within you, or all you are is a utensil. Set and all covered in dust in somebody's garage. And we need to learn to fight back. Now, how do I fight back? I got the Word of God. I've got the Word of God. That is my sword. That is the sword of the Spirit. You realize it is the only weapon that you have to fight with. Anybody know about the whole armor of God? <laughs> Helmet of salvation. Breastplate of righteousness. Loins girt about with truth. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shield of faith. Sword of the Spirit. The only thing i got to fight with is that book right there. When hell comes my way, this is what they're going to get. And it is because he said, not because I said. And we need to have that defense. We need to recognize it when it comes. See, we think seriously. I, I believe a lot of the church world thinks that, that when the devil comes, he's breathing fire, got two horns and a big pointy tail and all that kind of stuff. Now, usually when he comes, he's got his arm around. He said, hey, honey, come here. Nice and calm and quiet. Trying to sneak into your life in ways that we don't even see coming. If you ever read about the temptation of Christ, you're going to find something. And he used Deuteronomy most of the time. I guess every answer that Jesus gave hell. It is written. See how easy this is? It is That don't mean they're not coming. That don't mean it may not hurt. That means you hit me in the nose, I will hit you back. My daddy's bigger than your daddy. However you want to do it. You ever hear kids say that? I'll go get my dad. Well, my dad's bigger than your dad. Well, my dad drives a truck. I mean, you know, the kids are going to go. So what does hell want us to do? He just wants us to become lazy, to step back, to let everything go, just let the world circle around. Let's just float on top as best we can and let the world go by. And instead of floating, you know what we need to be doing? We need to be fishing. 
What did the Lord tell them when they pulled in the great <coughs> rod of faces? He said, you see what I can do? And you're going to do greater things because you're going to be fishers of men. That great drop that you brought in, imagine being a fisherman your whole life and it's the greatest thing you ever saw because of a man's word that don't know how to fish. Throw the nets off the other side of the boat. Let's see what happens. Lord, do you not realize we fished all night? Do you not realize those are my father's nets and I just washed them? I, I stacked them up and put them away. We got all the seaweed out. Everything is ready to go. I need some sleep. But at your word. Oh, powerful things. But at your word, we'll drag them back out. We'll push the boat out. We'll throw it off the other side. And, and honestly, you, you got to think, when they begin to tug, and that thing's so full, the nets are going to break, and they begin to tug. Well, it must be snagged on a rock. That can't be fish. And then they, hey, uh, Peter, get on this side of the boat and help me. Well, don't you realize we fished on that? Look, dude, I need help. And they began to pull. And it was so full, it was tipping the boat. Crack, it was going to sink. Let's get another boat out here. Need more help? Let's, let's pull. Let's do this together. And, and I said this last week, there's a revival coming to this world like this world has never seen. It's prophetic. It's written in a book, church. We're going to have, we're going to have, if we really believe Jesus is coming, we're going to have an opportunity to lead more men to the Lord than we've ever had in the history of the church. But the church has got to be ready for this. We've got to be willing to say that Jesus is Lord when nobody else wants to hear it. But you've got to be willing to do it. And when you say it, there's people going to come to Christ that, that have never even thought about it. The Spirit's going to do its job. The church just has to do its job. So now let's pick apart these people. Let, let's do one of those exegesis. We're going to take this and take it all apart. And we're going to look. So what's the characters we got in here? We're going to start with the five wives. They came to the wedding prepared. No, I'm not going to do that. That's for the lawyer. I'm not doing that. They came prepared. They came with the Spirit of God. They came, they came ready for what they were called to do. They came prepared. What happens when you've got enough of this stuff? You can light it, and you can keep it lit. All you have to do is have enough of this stuff. Just light it, and... Keep it lit. Keep it going. I like it. That changes that from a lamp into a light. They believed that the bridegroom was coming and they took action to meet that situation. They believed the bridegroom was coming. I asked you earlier, anybody believe the bridegroom was coming? He's coming. Going to be an announcement. They would get in front of the bridegroom. They would blow the trumpets. Here the virgins would come with their lamps to lead everybody back. Oh, such a beautiful procession. Such a great tradition. And yet in it all, although they had been taught, do you think the five foolish virgins knew they needed extra oil? Well, of course they did. They knew this. They have been taught this. I was reading this, and when the bridegroom went in, it, guess what happened? It said when a bridal party went in, they shut what? The door. You know where I read that at before? And I thought it was sort of odd, and it hit me. I thought, guess what? When they entered the ark, they shut the door. What happened to the people outside the ark? And I read a verse, and it's right down here. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. So we've got parables to teach us this stuff. We've got a Bible to teach us this stuff. Probably nothing I've said today you guys didn't already know. But are we doing anything about the bridegroom's coming? 
They believed he was coming back, so they took action. Now, what happens when you burn this thing? Now, I brought a different one here uh, instead of the big one. I should have brought the other one. But I, I thought about, now, once you start burning this, what happens? There's, there's three or four things that happen. What happens when you start, when you light that thing? How many of you grew up hillbilly? Never used one of these? What happens? What's the first thing that happens? Oil gets burned up. Got to turn them down when it does that. But think about it. The oil gets burned up. So what do you have to do? You renew the oil. And if the oil is the Spirit of God, that means we have to keep that relationship with God going every day. Do not lay your head on your pillow at night until you are certain everything is good between you and your Savior. We should be walking that way every day. Guess what? Things happen. When I get ready to go to bed at night, Father, I pray that I have pleased you this day. And if not, teach me and I'll do better tomorrow. I am willing to learn and to grow. I am by no means a perfect man, but we don't need to be laying our head down at night. You talk about sleeping much better? Use that for your pillow. Now what's the next thing that happens in here? That chimney gets dirty. Anybody ever see a dirty chimney? If you're there, you're, you're going to see it. Psalms 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Verse 10. What's he saying? Father, clean the chimney. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Refill it with oil. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Now the third thing you've got to do is trim the wick. And wick gets burnt on the end. And it doesn't pull the oil up as well. They get hard. They get crispy. You ever know a hard crispy Christian? <coughs> Don't look at nobody in text. No. Don't be turning your heads. I've seen some of them. <laughs> Did you ever know a hard crispy Christian? You got And see if you get into other parables of the Bible. It's simply called pruning. We got to cut the hard, crispy part off because that part's us. And we have to get to that part that the oil can be used. Because if we let that wick get hard and crispy on the end, it won't pull the oil up. Then it smokes, and you end up with a chimney fire, and you got all kinds of problems. My one son lives in the middle of an Amish neighborhood, and when he was little, he's a full grown man now, when he was little, the little neighbor boy got his first BB gun. <coughs> And his mom had washed all the lanterns and had all the chimneys setting on the porch rail. It had been a long time since I seen a boy get a whooping. And that boy got a whooping. His dad had to go down and get all new chimneys for all the way. Because he thought it was fun to watch him go pop. But think about that. Psalms 51 verses 10 to 12. In there, you got cleaning the chimney, you, you, you got refilling the oil, and you got trimming the wick, and it's all right there with David asking the Lord to keep him on the track that he needed to be on. Now let's jump to the foolish ones. Now understand the foolish ones were still virgins. <clears throat> Had it said uh, um, five virgins and five whatever you want to call them, well, we would have understood that, right? They're all virgins. <coughs> So what seemed to be the problem? They didn't have the oil. Now, what happens when they don't have the oil? Uh, the church world seems to be changing a lot, and I thank God for it. I thank God for it. There are ministers out there that are actually leaving, they're good men of God, they're leaving their denominations for rules that are being set that, that are unscriptural. I'll just say it straight out. What's being told them to do is unscriptural. They're saying, I will not, and they're leaving. They are becoming real men of God, saying that the word of God is more important than any hierarchy ever will be. Now, I'm not for church splits and everything else. I, I wish to God everybody was doing it just like the scripture says to do it. But, but the world doesn't work that way. And you know what's happening in the church world? Real men and women of God are having to stand up and say, this is the way it's going to be. Not like the world says. 
Well, you can't say that, Pastor Tom. That's hate speech. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And I don't know how much more love that you can give that somebody would give their son to die for you. So this has got nothing to do with hate speech. This has got to do with God's speech. And what the Lord says is the way it shall be. Well, at least in my life. How about you? Amen. I got three of them. All right. <laughs> You guys are dismissed. I'm going to preach to the rest of them. <laughs> so the church world, and, and a lot of Christians want to do it their way. They got their way of doing it. John 14, 6, Jesus said there's another way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. See how easy this is? See how easy it is? This isn't as hard as you think. I'm here today because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and for no other reason. I could not have done this on my own. I can't fix myself. I tried. How dumb of a human being do you guys think you're following that I thought I could get my life right all by myself? Well, it was a wonderful lesson to learn that I am a failure, but he is not. They believed they had a lot of time. They didn't have to take action right now. They would get to it. Matthew 24, 44. Be also ready for in such an hour as you think not. The Son of Man coming. The bridegroom's coming when he says he's coming. And you know the time to get ready? You know when that is? Now is the acceptable time. Now is the acceptable time. The bridegroom delayed his coming and they fell into problems. <coughs> For the foolish, they made a eternally fatal mistake. We see people in their lives. You ever see anybody in their life, they're making a mistake, you know they're making a mistake. You see it all the time. And you want to sit down and tell somebody, listen, the world will consume you. Sin will consume you. The path that you're on is going to lead to destruction physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. You're going to die. And I have an answer for you. They're not going to hear you. I've said this before. If I thought I could smack people hard enough to get them saved, I'd need bail money. People wouldn't be safe around me. Nobody want to talk to me unless he's already saved. But we can't do that. So what happened? A lot of times we give advice that somebody else won't take. And it can be good advice, godly advice, scriptural advice. And not everybody's going to take it. They'll answer for that. Guess what I want to answer for? Did you give it to them? We are the church and we have the answers. Proverbs 27, 1, and it said in the New Testament, it's requoted several times, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what tomorrow will bring. I guess as a kid, I was pretty good about, well, I'm going to run and do this tomorrow, or I'll run and do that tomorrow. I had a grandmother that would correct that immediately. She said, you need to learn something. I said, what's that? She said, you need to learn to say, Lord willing. Lord willing, what's God got to do with me going over to Billy's house to play? Just trying to teach a child that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And when I say I will be such as Lord willing, Lord willing, We need to realize that tomorrow's in his hands. Not in mine. Not in mine. I tell my wife, I'm serious, I'd, I'd like to live a few more years and die in my sleep fat and happy. How about you? I don't want to be in a car with Grandpa while he's taking a nap. <laughs> So 
So God has a plan. Now the plan is, the bridegroom's been here. He's gone. He's coming back to get the bride. It's all in a plan. It's all in a book. It's just as the bridesmaids, as the bridal party, are we a lamp or are we a light? Now is when we make those choices. Am I willing to be used of God when he speaks to me? Am I willing to go? Or is my life more important than just calling him out? Am I willing to step out when the Lord gives me that opportunity to bring up his name, to, to interject him into a situation, to say something simple? As I mean, anybody got folks that they just complain. And I mean, honestly, there's folks out there, I say it all the time, uh, the book of Job is a powerful book, but nobody volunteered to be Job. Do you think Job had a right to complain? I look at some of the stuff he went through. God help us and let us have a little empathy for people going through that. But when somebody's got life that is breaking apart and, and so much is happening and anything else, you have to be that light to say, I'll pray for you. Oh, let me get real personal for a minute. And it wouldn't hurt to reach right over and get him by the hand and say, I'll pray for you now. now. That I'll, I'll pray for you, you know, that's a church thing because we all say it. And honestly, I don't mean to throw stones at anybody, but I wonder sometimes for everybody that says, I'll pray for you, how many times that they've ever really prayed for anybody. It's an easy thing to say because we're in church and, and we love the Lord and, and we want God to move in such a wonderful way. But how many times out of our own personal lives do we take that time to really pray for somebody else? To look to God for them. And when we say, I'll pray for you, you just made an obligation. And you should stand up under your obligation. What happens if you make an obligation and you don't stand up under it? Husbands and wives leave. Banks come and get your car and house. There's a lot of things that can happen. And we understand that in the world. But in our spiritual lives, when we make that obligation, when we make that commitment, pray for them. Take that time out of your life, that personal time out of your life. And you know what? It's not a bad idea every now and again to pray for you. I used to never pray for myself. I pray for myself a lot now. <laughs> And it's not that I'm trying to be selfish or anything else. Guess what? My prayer life has completely changed. I wanted to have enough to feed children, to keep a roof over our head. You know, we pray for those kind of things as we're growing up and as we're getting older. We're working jobs and, and Father do this and God do that and help us and all that kind of stuff. You know, my prayer is almost all the time now. Father, let me accomplish the will that I was birthed for. That's my prayer nine-tenths of the time. Father, I've got to look you in the face shortly and I need you to be happy with me. Let me accomplish the purpose that you birthed me. Now that doesn't always take you where you want to go. Years ago, a very odd situation. I struggled for jobs for so many years of my life and a very odd thing came up that, that I had so many opportunities all at one time to go in different places and I actually had another minister tell me, well, you know, it'd be God's will for you to take the one that pays the most. God wants to bless you. And the church he attended, that's pretty much what they were about. They had a prosperity message. God wants to bless you. So it's God's will for you to take the one that pays the most. And I went, huh? I will seek the Lord and I'll find God's will in the situation. Well, one company I went to work for, I wasn't there very long. And I actually asked the question after I left there and went somewhere else, why, why would it even go here? And you ever have the Lord lean down and look at you with that dad look? While I was there, I had the opportunity to lead three different men to the Lord. And how dare I ask him why I was there? Didn't even have anything to do with the job. It had to do with my calling and men that needed to hear about Jesus. How dare I even ask him why I was there? Why did I even go here? Yeah, I was here such a short period of time and it really didn't work out and, and I went on and God blessed me and I went on to better paying jobs and, and jobs that, that better suited me and everything worked out so well. Why was I even there? And the reason that I was there had nothing to do with finance companies or anything else. 
Are you willing to be used of God? I don't know how, how many of you, if you went to church when you were kids, you ever sing that song? Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. See, we learned that when we were kids. I wonder how many of us remember that stuff. Because right now, all that thing is, is a lamp. It's not a lamp. It's not a lamp. Let me finish this up. So while we're waiting, the bridegroom comes, and the announcement goes out to go out and meet him. Not everybody was ready to go. And I, I'm still chewing on the fact that when they went back to get oil, and they come back and they knocked on the door, what did the bridegroom say? I don't know you. I don't know you. <clears throat> well, we're part of the bridal party, not today. Well, don't you know? No, I, I just know that I don't know you. Wow. Catch your breath on that one. Read that one three or four times. Let the Spirit talk to you about that verse. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house. Or what? Many mansions. I heard a big theological discussion on whether the translation was many mansions or many houses. I think if you're going to argue over that, you don't have your mind on the right thing. If I get to heaven, I don't care where they put me. I seriously think about it. Theological experts out there are going to argue over whether it's one house with a bunch of rooms or whether we all get our own house. I don't care. I do not care. They open that big pearly gate and I step through. Put me where you want me. I'm that weird duck. I won't stay at home much anyway. I got a bunch of stuff I need to see. What do they call it? Sublease. I'll let one of you guys live in my room. So in my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what's going to happen? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Deliberate preparation. How many images have ever moved recently? <coughs> Nobody moved? Why haven't you moved? My granddaughter's getting ready to move. Guess what she'd done? When hired somebody to move her. Yeah. Highly intelligent child. Yeah. I sat down and think, I, I'm serious. Just, just thinking about moving, I'll stay in my house till it falls over. I'm not going anywhere. I got way too much stuff. It's been over 20 years since we moved and I didn't like that one. And I've got a lot more stuff now than I had 20 years ago. So you sit down and you think about it. I'm getting ready to move, church. I can't tell you when. I'm getting ready to move. But you know the neat thing about me moving this time is where I am going. I am not taking any junk with me. It's all going to be new. Everything I need will be there. I don't know if they have espresso machines, but I can ask. <laughs> All I need is Mr. Coffee. I really don't need an espresso. <laughs> but see, I had to think about it. Where I'm going. Do, do you believe any of this? Where I'm going. There is a home waiting for me. And it's above and beyond. So to you to work. Above all that I can ask or think. I have no idea exactly what all this is going to be. I'm just asking you this morning. Are you a lamp or are you a light? Nothing wrong with a lamp. Lamps are good things to have. Lambs don't put out light. When the darkness begins to come, and our world is changing, folks. Our world is changing. Changing very rapidly. 
we got more people on the planet right now than we've had total from all the folks that's ever been. What does that mean? Does that mean I, I need to tuck my head in the sand and, and cover up like an ostrich? No, what that means is look up your redemption draws nigh and see how many people you can bring with you. So this morning, are you a lamp or are you a light? It, it's not a real deep message. It's just something to get us to think, to move, to react in the ways of God that he would have for us to do. And when that person comes to you, and they're all over the place, and you know them, but when they get you by the hand, and life is coming apart, you're going to tell them, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray for you right now. When the Lord begins to move, you're going to hear words of like, look what God has done for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, your word is true. Lord, you have called us to be lights in a dark world, and the darker it gets, the brighter we shall shine. Lord, in this day and in this time, Lord, let us not grow weary in the work of love, but let us stand strong in your word and your faith, ever growing, ever learning, that we too can be lights in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.